and welcome to the sanctuary. Thank you so much uh, to Garrett McCary and Carolyn Tennant for putting together that wonderful video for us. Um, so thank you all for being here and welcome. For those who I have not met, my name is KP Holler. I'm the recently appointed executive director here at the sanctuary. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, this is a very special weekend. We're so happy to have you joining us, and we're gathered here to do a number of things. We're here to celebrate the history of this amazing organization, to toast Steve Pierce for nearly two decades of transformative leadership, and to toast all of you who have helped to build this sanctuary campus over the years. We're also here to raise critical funds to set a course for a sustainable future. This is a truly full circle moment uh, the funds that were used to purchase the building that we have all come to know and love as the sanctuary were raised during one of Amy's visits to Troy. And here we are 18 years later, celebrating our growth from this historic church building to a multifaceted campus that includes Freedom Square, Nature Lab, and Colored City Growers. Um, and we're so close to being able to burn the mortgage on this entire campus. Thanks in no small part to Steve's leadership. Thank you. Through all of your generosity, um, we have raised over $8,500 so far, a real symbol of paying it forward in recognition of Steve's monumental impact and our collective belief in a bright future for the sanctuary. So today, you, we'll ask you to remember why independent voices are so important in art, science, and media, and why we all keep coming back to the sanctuary after all these years. Without further ado, I would like to welcome one of our board members, Eleanor Stein, uh, to the stage to introduce our amazing guest speaker for the evening. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. So today is Earth Day, the actual Earth Day. Um, 53 years since the first Earth Day when literally millions poured into the streets of the US and world cities. And I'm here to help us welcome my good friend Amy. We're, we share an extended family. We were brought together by the great human rights lawyer Michael Ratner many years ago. And Amy is a climate defender who travels each year to the annual summits, the climate summits, to bring us not only the images and the words of the heads of state who are usually selling us out in the blue zone, but also to introduce us to the global climate change movements, making change and making trouble in the green zones. And for over 20 years, Amy, with her co-founder and other great sanctuary friend, Juan Gonzalez, has started her work day at about 4 a.m. Why? To bring us the realities of oppression and resistance around the world, and not just surface facts, but the roots, the radical news, the roots of the problems, and the roots of the solutions, and the roots of resistance. So in just a couple of days this week, her show covered the dangers of radioactive chemicals that might be released into the Hudson River, wars in South Sudan and Yemen, abuse of Central American migrant children in factories across this country, deaths in prison, and the mendacity of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. In addition, last week, she featured a story introducing us to Haitian activist and human rights asylum seeker Jean Madrigal, who finally won a decision in court, allowing him to remain in the US. And he is the founder of something called the New Sanctuary Movement in New York City. So we shout out to our brother, Sanctuary in New York City. So Amy has been a beacon for us. She's been our conscience. She's been our voice. And she's heard and seen in other for over 1,400 outlets. Uh, all over the US and on the web worldwide. She's won many journalism awards. So let me ask you to join me in giving Amy for two decades a great friend to the sanctuary, and let's give her her real sanctuary for independent media. Welcome. Let's welcome Amy. Thank 
Thank you. 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 It is so wonderful to be back in the sanctuary for independent media, the sanctuary of dissent, to be celebrating where you have all come from and all that has to be done and all that you can do as you build this community even further. As Eleanor talked about what we've done over the last few weeks. One of the issues we've focused on um, are what's going on in the prison, in the jail in Fulton County and Atlanta. In the early hours of September 13th last year, Officer Gina Andrews approached cell 214 in the Fulton County Jail in Atlanta, Georgia, quote, to move inmate Thompson for psych evaluation. She said, I noticed inmate Thompson on the floor slumped over his head in the toilet. I called his name. I noticed he wasn't breathing and he wasn't moving. Thus began inmate incident number 7A22-3205, describing in cold bureaucratic language the grisly death of 35-year-old LaShawn Thompson, LaShawn Pennell Thompson, a black man suffering from mental illness. He'd been jailed for three months without charge in pretrial detention because he could not afford bail. LaShawn's family did not know where he was, the incident and autopsy reports they later obtained continue the grim account of his death. Officer Andrews asked a prisoner worker who was in a hazmat suit to attend to LaShawn as she reported inmate Thompson was covered in feces and lice. The reports include deeply disturbing photos that show LaShawn and death naked on a mat on the floor in the filthy cell. A close-up shows his face crawling with insects. The Fulton County medical examiner wrote, the body is infested with an enormous number of small insects that are two millimeters in length. Michael Harper, the attorney for the family of LaShawn, said the jail cell Mr. Thompson was housed in was not fit for a diseased animal. Harper appeared on Democracy Now! Joined by LaShawn's sister, Shanita, and his brother, Brad McKay, in their first broadcast interview. Since they went public with the gruesome details about their late brother's suffering and death, Brad talked about the family's decision to show the devastating photos with the public. I thought about Emmett Till, Brad said. It broke my heart to see those photos. We wanted the world to see it so the world can feel it and the world can wake up and see what's going on out there and get behind it and make a change. We want the world to wake up and make a change, Brad said. He was invoking the memory of Emmett Till the 14-year-old African-American boy who was sent down to Mississippi, Money, Mississippi, by his mom, Mamie Till Mobley, to spend the summer with his aunt and uncle and cousins to get out of the heat of Chicago. Days later, his brutally beaten, disfigured body, weighted down with a cotton gin fan tied to his body with barbed wire, was pulled from the Tallahatchie River. Emmett's mother wanted the world to see what they had done to her son. When his casket was sent back from Mississippi uh, to Chicago, she insisted the casket be open for the funeral. Jet Magazine published a picture of Emmett in his casket with his distended, brutalized head on them, showing the world the ravages of racism, the brutality of bigotry. 
Michael Harper said the jail knew that LaShawn Thompson had mental health issues in June of 2022. They put him in a psychiatric wing of that jail, neglected him. He was there for three months. There are reports in the incident report from the death that the officers were aware he was declining, was in a filthy cell. They complained to their supervisors. Nothing happened. He was there until he died. His body found infested with those horrible bed bug bites and lice and insects. LaShawn continued, uh, Harper continued, LaShawn Thompson was a pre-trial detainee. He had not been convicted of any crime. And how often the horror of these kind of detentions goes on. Last November, the Southern Center for Human Rights reported the Fulton County Jail was dangerously understaffed and overcrowded and had an uncontained outbreak of lice and scabies. The ACLU issued a report analyzing Fulton County's jail population, finding Fulton County regularly jails people in pretrial detention for longer than 90 days, some for over two years when they haven't even been charged with a crime. Many of those people held simply because they couldn't afford bail. Fulton County responded to the public revelations of LaShawn Thompson's horrible death by moving 600 prisoners of the jail's overcrowded population of close to 3,000, and the sheriff demanded the resignation of three top jail officials. County commissioners also approved $5 million for emergency improvements to the jail. The lawyer. Michael Harper said, a new jail is not going to stop neglectful detention office from not caring for mentally ill people, nor will it bring back LaShawn Thompson. Brad McKay, Brad McCray, LaShawn's brother, offered this hope in his brother's memory. He said, I want the world to remember him as I do, as a loving person, a playful person. He loved music, he loved to cook. I want the world to remember him as their cousin, their brother, their uncle, or whatever the case may be, because it could happen to their family, just like it happened to mine. Dennis Moynihan and I, who's here today, uh, the Special Projects Coordinator of Democracy Now! and who writes a column with me every week, um, wrote this column this past week. On Thursday, there was a mass protest in front of the Fulton County Jail. Um, ben Crum, uh, uh, who, uh, Benjamin Crump, who had joined the lawyer team for the Thompson family, um, said that Colin Kaepernick is now going to pay for an independent autopsy, though the one that was done by the coroner was pretty damning. And I think the fact that Brad McRae, who spoke to us from the historic city of Montgomery, Alabama, he was sitting in a studio just blocks from the lynching museum, the lynching museum that Brian Stevenson began. Um, and he was sitting in a studio in the city of Montgomery where Rosa Parks stood up, well, sat down, and in so doing stood up for everyone when she demanded the end of segregated busing in Montgomery. I think the power of independent media is amplifying the voices of people who are not usually heard, bringing together history and the remarkable historic moments um, with the present. So especially young people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time so that together we can imagine a different future. And when Brad, this young man, the brother of LaShawn, invoked Emmett Till, he was invoking Emmett Till because I started by asking him, after sharing our condolences at Democracy Now! with his family, why he wanted us to show the pictures. Because the pictures are gruesome. Is that how he wanted us to remember his brother? The fact that he invoked the memory of Emmett Till and how his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, demanded 
that her dead son's disfigured face be seen by the world to change the world. Mamie Till Mobley had something very important to teach the press of today. Show the pictures. Show the images. And if we did that, with everyone who dies in jail, who perhaps is killed by the death, by the state, uh, using the death penalty. If these images are shown of people on the ground who've been killed in war, I really do think that war, the brutality, that prisoner, the violence against prisoners, I think it could end if we saw the images. And that's the important importance of places like this sanctuary, like Democracy Now!, independent media all over the world, not brought to us by the prison industrial complex when we cover mass incarceration, not brought to us by the weapons manufacturers. I don't like to talk about the defense industry, the weapons of war manufacturers, because that's what, for example, assault weapons are. Whether we're talking about them overseas or here at home on the streets of our cities. When we cover the climate catastrophe, we're not brought to you by the oil, the gas, the coal, the nuclear companies. When we cover inequality, we're not brought to you by the banks or financial institutions. We're brought to you by you. And that's what this sanctuary is built on, the community saying, this is what we need, this is what we'll support to ensure that our stories and the stories of others all over the world get told. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death. And anything less than that is a disservice to the servicemen and women of this country. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. So I am so honored to be here tonight to celebrate independent media. I want to talk about another development in these last few weeks. Um, and I'm going to take off on interviews we did on Democracy Now! in a column Dennis and I did in the last few weeks called no Justins, no peace. No Justins, no peace. That's right. The largely white Tennessee House of Representatives, with its heavily gerrymandered Republican supermajority, several weeks ago, expelled two members, the youngest two black legislators in the Tennessee State Legislature. Justin Jones of Nashville, where the week before a mass shooting, another mass shooting had taken place, this one at the Christian Covenant School, killing three nine-year-old students and three adults. And they expelled Justin Pearson, who represented Memphis, Dr. King's Memphis, where Dr. King died in 1968 of gun violence. They stood accused, the Justins, of breaching house decorum for nonviolently protesting the chambers in action on gun violence in the wake of yet another mass school shooting. Three nine-year-olds, I repeat, three nine-year-old children and three adults were killed in that massacre by one single shooter armed with an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle, a weapon of war. <coughs> 
At that time, the count, now it's over 150, the count of mass shootings in the United States in 2023 was 146. Over 1,000 people marched on the Capitol across the political spectrum, flooding the Senate and House galleries, chanting demands for gun control. During a House recess, Jones and Pearson went to the floor with a small bullhorn. They were joined by Democratic Representative Gloria Johnson. She was a former teacher who herself had survived a shooting uh, years ago. These elected officials were later dubbed the Tennessee Three. And tomorrow, on Monday, they'll be meeting with President Biden at the White House. Infuriated, the Republican House Speaker Cameron Sexton pledged to punish them. In a radio interview later, Sexton said the three were worse than the January 6th insurrectionists who stormed the Capitol in 2021. On Thursday, April 7th, the House held three separate votes. The Republicans voted to expel the two Justins, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson, but failed to muster enough votes to purge Representative Gloria Johnson, again, who's white. When asked later why she thought she avoided expulsion, Johnson said it might have had something to do with the color of my skin. During the six-hour expulsion proceedings, each of the targeted Democrats were questioned by their Republican accusers. Justin Pearson was admonished by State Rep Andrew Farmer, whose tone dripping with contempt clearly echoed Tennessee's racist roots. He said, that's why you're standing there, because of that temper tantrum that day, for that yearning to have attention. That's what you wanted. Well, you're getting it now as he was about to be expelled, the white state representative said to him. The Tennessee House Speaker Cameron Sexton drove the effort to expel the black legislators. It wasn't his first confrontation with Justin Jones. In 2020, as a Black Lives Matter activist following the police killing of George Floyd, Justin Jones, now the Nashville state rep, then led a successful movement to remove the bust of Nathan Bedford Forrest from the state capitol rotunda. Forrest, a Tennessean enslaver, plantation owner, and Confederate Army general, is revered by racist white Southerners. Forrest was accused of numerous atrocities and war crimes during the Civil War. He led the massacre at Fort Pillow, 40 miles north of Memphis, where Confederate forces are believed to have killed hundreds of unarmed Union troops after they surrendered. Forrest was also the first Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, which was founded in Tennessee. Cameron Sexton, the current House Speaker, voted against removing his bust from the rotunda. Oh, then there was Holocaust Remembrance Day last year, January 27th. The House Speaker Sexton interrupted a floor speech by Democratic Representative John Ray Clemens, whose wife is Jewish. Clemens was criticizing a Tennessee county banning the Holocaust memoir, Mouse, by Art Spiegelman. Sexton stopped what he had to say on the floor. Justin Jones has repeatedly called on the House Speaker to resign. By most accounts, Sexton's campaign to purge the Tennessee Three has failed miserably. Just in the last few weeks, right after the expulsion, Jones was unanimously reappointed to the State House by the Nashville City Council. Then Justin Pearson rallied with supporters in Memphis in front of the historic Lorraine Motel. It was on that second floor balcony, April 4th, 1968, almost 55 years ago, that Dr. King was assassinated. He rallied, Pearson rallied, almost 55 years to the day that the Tennessee House expelled these two young black elected officials. After the Shelby County commissioners voted unanimously to reappoint Pearson to the legislature, he spoke, invoking 
Dr. King's words. Pearson said, the message for all the people in Nashville who decided to expel us, you cannot expel hope, you cannot expel justice, you cannot expel our voice, and you sure can't expel our fight. We look forward to continuing the fight, continuing to advocate until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let's get back to work, he said. In 1892, about 125 years ago, a white mob burned the offices of the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight newspaper to the ground. In retaliation for the fearless anti-lynching reporting by the newspaper's co-owner, the legendary black investigative journalist, Ida B. Wells. Almost 130 years later, Justin Jones wrote a book about his own political trajectory called The People's Plaza about the protest in Nashville following the 2020 police killing of George Floyd. He opens the book with a quote from Ida B. Wells who said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Well, in Nashville, the Tennessee Three are doing just that. They will meet with President Biden on Monday at the White House, redefining the White House. Um, and they teach us something very important, again, as we dip back into history, to Ida B. Wells, to the importance of independent media that brings us right here today. Whether we're talking about the sanctuary, for independent media, or we're talking about Pacifica Radio, where Democracy Now! came out of 27 years ago. Um, I've often told the story of Pacifica, but I think it fits in so appropriately what, right here. Pacifica Radio, the oldest independent media network in this country, was born in Berkeley, California in 1949, the first Pacifica station, KPFA, in Berkeley, founded by a man named Lou Hill. And I was deeply touched as the doors were locked at the sanctuary today, and we spent the time, you always want to spend every minute usefully, reading all of the quotations on the front of the sanctuary. And I saw just above the door, I took so many pictures, it's going to take a minute to find it, just above the door, the beautiful quote of Lou Hill, the founder of Pacifica Radio, who said, as long as I can communicate, I can create. As long as I can create, I am free. Yes, I do think that independent media that forum for dissent, the table that stretches across the globe that we all debate around can set us free when it is free. Lou Hill founded Pacifica Radio in Berkeley, California. Um, he was resisting war when he came out of the detention camps. He said, there's got to be a media outlet not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. Um, or as the great um, dean at the Annenberg School of Communications, George Gervner, said, we need a media not run by corporations that have nothing to tell and everything to sell that are raising our children today. And so KPFA went on the air in 49, KPFK in Los Angeles, I was just raising money for it this past week, um, uh, went on the air in 1959. Our station in New York, WBAI, where I first met Steve Pierce, went on the air in 1960. And WPFW in Washington on the air in 1977, and KPFT in Houston went on the air in 1970. That's the five Pacifica stations, the Fab Five. And that, it's that station in Houston uh, that I wanted to talk about for a minute, KPFT, and how it relates to um, even what's happening in Tennessee. 
with the House Speaker trying to preserve the bust of the um, first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. I can't remember if it's Grand Wizard, um, uh, Grand Cyclops, or um, I often confuse their titles, but I, I will. I, we have to be accurate as journalists. But KPFT went in the air in 1970. Within a few weeks, it was blown up by the Ku Klux Klan. They strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. KPFT immediately um, uh, jumped into action, and within a few weeks, they rebuilt the transmitter, and KPFT went on the air. And the Klan strapped 15 times the dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it up again, right in the middle of um, Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant, which I actually think is a very good song. But um, <laughs> it took a while then after that, a couple months for KPFT to get back on their feet. In 1971, January, um, they rebuilt the transmitter. The media actually came and paid attention. Arlo Guthrie came back to Houston to finish Alice's Restaurant on the air, and KPFT went on the air again and hasn't pretty much gone off since then. Um, but I think the words of the Grand Wizard or the Cyclops or Dragon, whatever their name is, um, his words then were very important. Um, he was proud of what he had done, of blowing up the transmitter. And that's why it's so important independent media continue. He called it his proudest act. Why? Because I think he understood how dangerous independent media is. Dangerous because it allows people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's an Iraqi child, an Afghan aunt, uh, uncle in Palestine or a grandma in Israel. It breaks down bigotry and stereotypes, right? I'm not saying you have to agree with who you hear, but it makes you, you much less likely want to destroy the person. It's that understanding that's the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war. And that's why it's so important that we take the media back. And that's what this sanctuary is really all about, is starting at the local level to bring out the stories of people in Troy, in Schenectady, in Albany. And of course, people come in from all over the world and it's through these conversations and these stories that we realize our commonalities and also our beautiful differences. What makes this planet, the population, so diverse? And that's why it's critical that you have sanctuaries like this that celebrate difference and also amplify what we have in common. Uh, and that's why it's so important that we preserve this space and use it as a model for people in every community. Do not take this place for granted. You know, I travel the world, I travel this country at least before the pandemic I did, and it's very rare to have a sanctuary like this uh, that explicitly is about people speaking for themselves, creating your own media, challenging those in power, keeping them accountable and honest for all of us to live in a more sustainable, just, and equitable world. Um, I have my little puppy, Zazu, here. Um, I am a vegan. She is not, as she chews on her bone at my feet. <laughs> Um, with my full approval. Um, this is my first time bringing her on the road because I got her during the pandemic. Her name is Zazu. Every time I walk down the street and I share her name with someone, they say, oh, the Lion King. I had no idea there was a bird named Zazu, the Lion King. Uh, but she was named after um, some freedom fighters. 
the French youth of occupied France during World War II. Uh, they loved swing and jazz. They would go to the underground nightclubs, especially the expat ones. Uh, they dressed kind of like David Byrne. And they fought the Nazis and the fascists, and they were often targeted by them. They were the Zazu. They were the freedom fighters. Little Zazu is a freedom biter, and I just, <laughs> and she now comes with me everywhere. So this is a great experiment to see if I could make it through a talk, and she seems extremely interested in her bones, so this is definitely promising. Um, but that brings me to another story, very seriously. But we all, you know, live lives that, um, where we are very grounded in reality and have um, beautiful families, dysfunctional families, people we love, people we don't get along with, but people we must learn to live with. And that's also what media is about. It's learning from each other, how we get by together. And I also think that's what the pandemic taught us. For those of us who are lucky to survive, and my condolences to anyone who lost loved ones during the pandemic, and let's never forget it was not equal opportunity because we don't live in an equal world. In the United States, those who died of COVID all too often were the least fortunate among us, least access to health care. Um, we need to have Medicare for all. So health insurance is not the decider of who lives and who dies in this country. But it taught us about the importance of community and what it means for us all to be together. I mean, even here, um, I always walk around with a mask and when I get a, into an elevator with someone, they say, oh, excuse me, because many people don't wear masks. I guess you don't, well, you're afraid of me. I say, oh, no, 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 no. You should be afraid of me. I consider myself typhoid Mary, and I don't want to infect you. And that's changed people's attitudes so much. It's not you I'm afraid of. I'm afraid I could somehow hurt you. So we have to protect each other, and each of us has to start with ourselves as we reach out in the world. Um, there are great risks, but of course there are greater risks in not reaching out, and we have to fill, figure out how to build community together um, in these times, which keeps me back in World War II, to the talking about the White Rose Collective, who were their own kind of journalists. Um, I think of Hans and Sophie Scholl. They were brother and sister. They weren't Jewish, they were Christian Germans. But they thought, what can we do in the face of the Nazi atrocity? Um, Hans was a medical student at the University of Munich, and Sophie, his sister, was an undergraduate. And they and their professor and some others, students, formed the White Rose Collective. And they decided they needed to inform Germans about what was happening so that they would never be able to say, we didn't know. They published a series of six pamphlets, and on one of those pamphlets it said, we will not be silent. They would have them distributed everywhere, drop them in an alleyway, at a marketplace in the middle of the night, hurl them from um, a balcony at the university, and they would fall on the atrium for students and professors and staff to see. Hans and Sophie and their professor were eventually caught by the Gestapo. They were tried, they were they were charged, they were tried, they were convicted, and they were beheaded. But that philosophy, that motto, should be the Hippocratic Oath of us all today. We will not be silent. Democracy now.
have been spoken that this was a celebration about Steve, and I want to bring uh, Garrett to the stage with me. My name is Eileen Javier. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the president of the Board of Directors for the Sanctuary for Independent Media. We're very happy and honored that all of you are here and that Amy is here. So once upon a time, a group of Indian media makers walk into this old church in an easily uh, forgotten neighborhood north in North Troy. And one of those is Steve Pierce, who I don't see him here. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Steve, you brought the world to Troy through music, through independent media. What cemented that seed is that experience with your father. He really shaped who you are. And he opened up your mind to create a space for all of us to exchange ideas, to open up our world, to create, to build community, to bring people like Amy Goodman, like Chris Hedges, and all of us that are organizing and creating movements. So on behalf of the Sanctuary for Independent Media, we would like to give Steve an award because of 18 years of work for all of us bringing independent media and what made Steve so special. There are two things that Steve always share, music, world music, independent media, community organizer, volunteering, and I, I wanted to really give you a bullhorn because I like that, <laughs> that when there is an activist movement, Steve is right there marching. But we're gonna stick to two things, music yesterday, independent media. Can you please show Steve his award, Garrett? And come stage, you're gonna love it. <laughs> We work very hard to keep this a secret <laughs> from him. <laughs> Can you please get up and give a round of applause to Steve? 18 years, 18 years. <laughs> I think it's okay. <laughs> he has done it. <laughs> now we're going to have a conversation between Amy and Steve. Thank you for being here. This is a, an original uh, Edison uh, wax cylinder. And uh, you take it and you actually just slide it on. You heard the great quality of the sound of it, right? <laughs> uh, what they also did with this was they, um, they actually had uh, comedy routines as well that you could get. So you, this is a two minute uh, uh, cylinder. And uh, uh, so you put it in, obviously everything was, was done by crank and by spring. And uh, the machine itself is uh, 1903, so we're looking at uh, 120 years of it, and this was really the first way. This was actually 20 years before there was any uh, commercial radio station. So this is the only way people really heard music back then. Uh, I think Edison created it in the 1880s, and uh, this is one of his last uh, one of his last designs because uh, the other guys came out with the flat disc, which sounded a little better, as you know. Anyway, just wanted to tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, 
So this is really great. Um, I was wondering what I'm going to do with my time when Netflix cancels my sharing account. <laughs> and I'm figuring I'm not signing up for another streaming service. I'm going back to media that I own and control. And so I think going with wax is what we all should be doing. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Steve, congratulations, and thank you for all that you have done, not only for the sanctuary, but for independent media. Um, because when one place like this is built, it has a ripple effect all over. And I think um, where this will go is what we'll talk about in, uh, in a little while. But I want to talk about how this all began. Steve, you and I met at WBAI in, what was it, 1980? Uh, 1987. <laughs> and Steve was the operations director at WBAI in New York. Um, <clears throat> our loss was your gain when he left WBAI. And what brought you to Troy, New York? Uh, well, I came to go to grad school at RPI. And what did you major in? I got a PhD in the, from the Department of Science and Technology Studies, and it was based on uh, really um, uh, communication and political science, what we can do uh, using communications technology to try to deal with the, the major issues of our time and focused on community media. And talk about how the Sanctuary for Independent Media was born. Well, it's a long story. It starts, I mean, a lot of the people in the room know this because they were there with me, which I really appreciate. There's so many people involved in this. It's a little awkward for me because uh, I, although I do appreciate the honor, uh, you know, obviously it couldn't have been done. Um, I couldn't have done it myself. Um, starting with Brandon Miller, who's downstairs switching this uh, program, and uh, Kathy High. Yay, Brenda! And so many people. Uh, the danger that I have, uh, the danger of... Uh, Okay, so, oh, I'm going to take your mic. Easy come, easy go. I don't know. Check one, two. That one. Check one, two. <laughs> hey, Kaylin. Okay, so this is. <laughs> that was the original one. This is all part of an elaborate. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Abbott and Costello. This is the modern day equivalent of that. Uh, Mike is on first. Uh, I, I might have lost my train of thought here, but oh yes, I was thanking people, of course. Uh, many, so many people that I, I hesitate to start naming names because I'm obviously going to forget somebody and, and regret it. But uh, really, uh, if if not you, somebody sitting next to you was involved in creating this. Um, it really started for me, I, I had a career in community media um, that included a uh, stand in New Orleans, a, a community radio station there, WWOZ, and uh, freelancing as a journalist for NPR and Pacifica Radio, which had a news show at the time. And uh, I went on to work in New York at WBAI, where I met Amy. Um, I was afraid that um, nothing good would happen with Amy. She was a hard worker, but she just didn't really seem to have what it takes to be successful. So. <laughs> Uh, that was really the beginning of my HR career, a, a, dismal, uh, a, a dismal HR career. I shouldn't be in it. Um, but I spent a year there at WBAI and, and worked at uh, Deep Dish TV, which was a community television uh, project, and went on to grad school to try to, you know, figure out more about the, the overview, the overview of the situation that, that we're in, with, uh, both with media and, and politics in this country. And there I became involved at uh, the, the uh, student radio station, WRPI at RPI, which at the time had a very robust um, uh, community involvement. And we um, uh, gathered together really under the banner of Democracy Now!, which was new at the time. I think w WRPI was one of maybe, I mean, less than 10 stations that was airing uh, the program outside of the Pacifica network. And uh, that was the core, really. The people who were involved at that time at WRPI became the core of Indie Media, uh, which was a movement around 2000. Uh, a, a global movement of, that evolved into, I don't know, almost 100, maybe more than 100 uh, 
uh, decentralized media organizations around the world. Um, and we had one here. It was called the Hudson Mohawk Independent Media Center. Uh, we worked at uh, we worked out of the um, YWCA in Troy and uh, any place we could find a space. And we found ourselves bouncing around all the time trying to find space. Space was so urgent. And uh, that's in a place where space is much less expensive than it is in most places in the world. Um, people come visit from New York and, and New York City and see what we have here and they, they can't believe it, uh, that we have so much uh, and it costs so little. But for us, it wasn't little. And it was, it was just always a struggle to find a place to host speakers. Uh, the first time Amy came here, I think was in 1996 maybe. Uh, to do a, uh, a benefit for the Friends of WRPI because we were running the show. And it was at Mother Earth's Cafe in downtown Albany, which was a, a small cafe that was, was the only place we could find where they would allow us to come and do a political talk. And every time we tried to do a, an event, it was a, a real struggle. The Chapel and Cultural Center at RPI, or uh, Christ Church in Troy, or uh, Livingston Magnet School in Albany. It was always finding, trying to find a place. It was very difficult uh, for speakers and for music even harder because the music economy is fueled by alcohol and by mass market music. It's very difficult to find a place to host a band from Africa that doesn't have any commercial potential in the United States. And so it became obvious to us that we need our own place. We need our own space. Or not only to do presentations, we actually found the space first because we had to leave the YWCA and we needed a place for our editing equipment um, and just to work. And so we worked in the basement of this building uh, kind of huddled together for warmth because it was uninsulated and uh, in pretty bad shape. And we used the upstairs for fundraisers. And the fundraisers were uh, events like film screenings, talks, um, different kinds of speakers, uh, all different kinds of things, and uh, music. And so um, we originally rented it. Is, is Russell Zamber here today? I don't know if uh, he was the original owner of the building. Thank you, Russell. Russell let us use it for the cost of his taxes when we started. And um, we, um, we realized that if we could afford to pay the taxes on it, if we became a nonprofit, we could avoid the taxes and use that to pay the mortgage. Uh, and so uh, that was the beginning of uh, this physical presence that we have in Troy, uh, North Troy, uh, which was at the time, I, I, I don't think I'd ever been to North Troy. And it wasn't on the way to any place that I went. So uh, it was really hard. I remember the first two or three times I came here, I couldn't find it because 6th Avenue turns into 5th Avenue there and there's all these obstacles to uh, finding us, uh, which now with GPS, one of the good things about the march of time is that you can now uh, find the place with your phone. Uh, but anyway, that was, you know, I could go on and on, but that was the, the trajectory and it was all based on finding a stable place that uh, if we didn't own it, at least we controlled it. Um, and now we own it, although we, uh, you know, we're partial owners of it along with the Community Loan Fund of the Capital Region, and that's one of the things we're talking about tonight. What, could, what would it take to kick her through the goalposts, secure our future, just like you as homeowners, if you are, secure a place where you can be and not be worrying all the time about getting evicted or doing something that's going to annoy people. Those of you who have been around long enough know that in 2008, the city of Troy shot us down because they didn't like what we were doing here. We had the radical idea that going to war in Iraq would be a, a bad thing to do, not just for us, but for everybody in the world. It was an unpopular opinion at the time, and they shut us down for uh, presenting an Iraqi American artist who had that view. And so those are the kinds of reasons why you- Something to do with the size of the doors? Yes, they said that after 100 years, as a church, our doors were two inches too narrow and had to be, uh, we had to be closed immediately uh, to preserve public safety, <laughs> literally. And so, um, we shut down and, and uh, a number of venues in, in uh, Troy and throughout the capital region became uh, sanctuaries in exile and allowed us to present a variety of programs during the six weeks that we were closed. Uh, we, it was, uh, actually, it turned out to be a great thing for us. It was pretty stressful at the time. Um, I'd never felt so naked, really, in a way. I remember sitting in the basement and when, they, when I got the message from, this, from the city, I thought, oh my God, what do we, you know, how do you fight these people? I mean, they, they, they have all the power. They have code enforcement, they have the police, they have, they have it all. And I, for a moment, got a glimmer of what it's like to live here as a tenant in one of these buildings in the neighborhood. I mean, it's just terrifying, because you have nowhere to turn. Well, it turned out that the people who we didn't even know were supporters of ours came to our rescue, and it turned out to be a great fundraiser for us, so much so that we tried to book terrorists whenever we could, <laughs> in, the, in the hope that, or at least accuse terrorists, in the hope that we could get shut down again. 
and do some more fundraising. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what happened to us in 2008, and we've had a trajectory since then of continually trying to do things to improve the neighborhood and to try to improve our position in it and to do more um, in, a, in a neighborhood that really had been abandoned. You know, there's thousands of vacant properties in the capital region, Albany, connected to Troy, and hundreds of them are right around us. And on our block, there were 10, in one block, 10 vacant properties, buildings and lots. And we were trying to run an organization here as plywood was going up on buildings all around us. And we realized that um, we, couldn't stay in, we, we couldn't just stay hunkered down ourselves in the place that we owned, because nobody would come here. It was falling apart around us. And so we started taking charge of it ourselves, because the, the city had made us, had made North Troy a sacrifice zone. They were just going to let it fall apart and focus on the downtown and the neighborhoods where there are middle class homeowners and just sacrifice the tenants, sacrifice long term residents here who just don't have a lot of money. And uh, we started buying properties that uh, were abandoned because it was incredibly inexpensive, uh, relatively, a couple hundred dollars for a vacant lot, uh, buying properties uh, from the banks when they went up for foreclosure and got to a point now where we have the sanctuary, we have the uh, Freedom Square, we have a residency space across the street where we uh, host visiting artists and interns, and now a couple of, since the pandemic, a couple of our staff people live there. We have gardens, and we just opened the Nature Lab and People's Health Sanctuary in a building that had been abandoned for 20 years. Looking for something to do. Well, thank all of you. Looking for something to do with these buildings. What can we do with these buildings that doesn't involve exploitative relationships with tenants, which is the only economic model that people can figure out in neighborhoods like this. And we, we're sitting on the material culture, the leftovers of capitalism. People were made rich on the banks of the Hudson with the industrial operations and the other kinds of things in the 1800s that made Troy fabulously wealthy. And people took that wealth out of the city and went to wherever they are and left behind you know, the rest of us. And so we're, we're searching for a model of what can be done with all of this potential, human potential, architectural potential, everything that it takes to carve out a, a meaningful life, and not wait for somebody else to do it. Because it became clear to us that not only are not, they're not coming to do it, but they'll also try to crush us when we try to do it if it seems to present a threat. And so that's been, our, that's been our goal, in addition to doing the, uh, while we're you know, having music and dance parties and speakers and films, it's part of the process. We have to do it. You know, <clears throat> there's this indie media movement around the country, and, um, but rarely did you have people completely own their own space. I think of in um, Champaign-Urbana, Urbana-Champaign, they bought the post office. And you guys have the sanctuary. And you're really two of the last remaining uh, independent media groups that have actually grown. But for people who are here tonight, there may not be many who don't know all these properties and what their point is. You just took me on a tour, which is amazing. You have the sort of concert space outside, the public space. Describe each one of these um, properties that you have, whether inside or a house, and what they're doing inside. I will. I'll, I'll just say very quickly, you mentioned Champaign-Urbana. Uh, they literally bought the US post office in Urbana. A, a building, of, you know, five-story building that occupies an entire city block downtown. And I went there uh, f for a conference or some sort of indie media gathering, and I thought, if they can buy the sag if they can buy the post office, we can buy an abandoned church in North Troy. Uh, it, it's certainly possible. What can we do to do that? And I've been inspired. We've all been inspired by traveling around the country and seeing what other people are doing. And one uh, place that uh, really st um, sticks in my mind was Detroit. I remember being, having been here for a few years and just feeling depressed at how, how hard it was, you know, just the trash and, uh, you know, just, just urban living in a place where people aren't getting the services that they need to make it livable. And I went to Detroit, you know, abandoned buildings, all, all that. I went to Detroit, which is filled with abandoned buildings. Detroit used to be the most prosperous city in America. And it was just kicked to the curb, just left for whoever wanted it. Uh, North Troy, Arbor Hill, Hamilton Hill, times a thousand, the whole city. 
And I went there, and it was filled with young people who were taking over the storefronts, taking over the houses, taking chances, because the barrier to entry was so low. Nobody wanted it. And they were creating bicycle shops and gardening collectives and uh, coffee shops and you know whatever. And if they failed at what they were doing, they stopped and they started doing something else. They just kept going with it. And I came back to Troy and I thought, well, this is fantastic. There's vacant buildings all over the place and trash. This is great. We can do that here. So that was the inspiration, really, for, for getting started with this. Uh, Freedom Square came about because uh, when the city closed us down because our doors were two inches too narrow, we were thinking, OK, what are they going to do next? And we thought, parking, that's a favorite. Uh, and so we realized uh, that uh, although we got permission to open this place, uh, even though we didn't have the required 70 parking spaces for a new church, uh, there, no one has any cars in the neighborhood because they can't, not nobody, but many people are here without cars. They can't afford them. Um, and there's so many vacant properties that the number of spaces on the street are more than adequate for the people who have cars. And so we did time-lapse photography. Actually, uh, was it Penny Lane? I don't remember who it was who did. I think it was Penny Lane who did the, uh, our Penny Lane, not the other one. Uh, who did the uh, time-lapse photography. We went to the city and showed them that there was no parking problems. But we realized that that might not be enough, and so Freedom Square became available. The church that was on that lot, there used to be four churches within a block of here, including this one. Um, the, the congregation had decided to tear the church down because they had a roof leak and uh, couldn't figure out how to fix it and how to maintain it. And so there was a vacant lot there which had some parking spaces. So we bought it to get the parking spaces and quickly realized that having an outdoor space would be a great way to reach out to people who didn't feel comfortable coming in. Culturally or for whatever reason, it was hard to do neighborhood outreach. And so we went out into the neighborhood and we uh, have been doing free concerts with free music, free food, free art activities uh, for, the, for the community. And have been doing that since we purchased Freedom Square. And since then we built the stage and it's a big community art project uh, that the uh, uh, kids throughout the uh, neighborhood participated in doing the mosaic out there. Um, I'm going to speed it up because there's a, we have a you know there's a long story to tell and I won't try to do it all here. But Freedom Square, Freedom Square was really the beginning of an understanding that we could do this ourselves. We bought the lot for four thousand dollars, which seemed like a huge amount of money at the time. Um, and then I think. Uh, we ended up purchasing a lot that we turned into a garden. We, we, were, we were finding one of, the, one of the things we did early on was we realized that because of all the vacant properties and the absentee landlords, sidewalks don't get shoveled in the winter, lawns don't get mowed, there's no basic maintenance that you take for granted in a community where there are vested people who can afford uh, to take care of their properties and who want to because they're their properties. And so after a few winters of um, dealing with shoveling sidewalks and so forth, we started, uh, we bought a snowblower, and because people would be, would be going down the street during the winter with their kids in strollers in the middle of the street because you couldn't go on the sidewalks. The only place it was plowed was the, was the, was the roadway. So we bought a snowblower and started, we took it on as an organizational commitment to snowblow the riverside of 6th Avenue from Freedom Square to what was then a Stewart's, so people could at least get from the bus stop to do grocery shopping. And uh, that, was a, that was the philosophy that started, you know, we started picking up. Why not, we, we started buying vacant lots uh, because we were picking up the trash on them anyway. And so we bought lots that we turned into gardens, uh, which you'll see at the Color City uh, Growers, which is halfway down the block here. Um, we, uh, we ended up, there was a beautiful Victorian across the street fr from us um, that uh, we saw broken windows and doors open after a long time of stable tenancy. It had been purchased by a, an investor in California just before the mortgage bubble um, broke in 2008. And uh, he bought the building after going to, maybe it was a Trump-funded real estate seminar. Um, they thought, oh, a brownstone in New York. Thinking New York City, um, he bought a brownstone in North Troy and uh, paid too much and then got a mortgage on it. Uh, and. Um, ended up evicting the people who were in it because they couldn't afford the rent anymore. And it sat vacant ever since. And we watched it fall apart. We, we saw on the ground what you could read about in the news headlines, what was happening in urban America everywhere. And um, the pipes were stolen, the wiring was stolen. And I walked in there one day and it was just this incredible Victorian that all, somehow the woodwork and everything was still intact. It was still, it still looked great. Uh, you know, 
minus the wiring and the pipes and so forth. So we, we boarded it up and we started a tug of war with the uh, uh, drug addicts who were going in and out of there and eventually were able to purchase it from the bank. We, we had to force the bank to sell it because they would rather keep it on the books for the book value of the property rather than sell it for the actual value, which would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference. So we shamed them into selling it to us. I think we paid $10,000 for it, turned it into the residency space that I talked about. Um, and then we, you know, so, uh, the, the, the main part of the story for us, the most recent thing was the purchase of the building that has become Nature Lab, which has been, had been vacant for 20 years, just sitting there. And we bought it uh, uh, through the land bank and then renovated with help from the Department of Environmental and Conservation and many volunteers, some of whom were here. Uh, my, my friend Larry Electric, who uh, coincidentally is an electrician, um, and, and uh, not entirely coincidentally, uh, lives in Ohio and actually came here and uh, on a vacation rewired, actually did wiring in this building initially and then rewired all of the second floor of Nature Lab. Um, it's incredible. Um, he went in for triple bypass surgery immediately after that. I'm not sure if we had anything to do with it, but he's breathing well now and everything's good. Uh, St. Wayne, I don't know if he made it here today, but he's done so much of the uh, work on this building and the others, just all volunteer driven. I didn't fully appreciate that until we did the first floor of Nature Lab, which was grant supported, which it cost $200,000 to do one floor at you know market rates, and then $20,000 to do the second floor with volunteer help. So that's mm -hmm. been the, that has been the engine driving us f from the beginning, not just in terms of the real estate and that part, but the community media is driven by volunteers. And ultimately now for all the property that you've bought, and it's never about the bricks and mortar clearly, you know, it's about the mission and what can be done with this. What, how much do you need, uh, does the sanctuary need for the whole sanctuary campus uh, to retire the debt? So um, our mortgage is about $1,000 a month for uh, everything. Uh, which people are staggered by. Um, that's the advantage of buying property that's not worth a whole lot when you start. Um, but to, to retire the debt, I think for, uh, from the Community Loan Fund, which is a fantastic organization, um, $25,000 wow. is what we have left. We've been paying it off for uh, parts of it for you know um, 18 years, and uh, we're, we're that close. Wow. So. And we have this many people here. I know that we can begin <laughs> to do it, which brings us Lock into, the doors. into the next part of this evening. Um, and who was it that was coming up to, uh, we're gonna have a Q and A with all of you and Steve and I and Zazu will be sitting here to answer your questions. Um, but maybe before that, if, you would like to help us in that effort, we have tried to make it as easy as possible for you to make a contribution. So, you should have found on your chair when you arrived a copy of our season schedule, and tucked inside of there is an envelope with a form that you can fill out for a credit card, check, or cash donation. Yeah. There are also, um, along the walls in here and in the cafe, some scanned scannable QR codes to donate via Venmo, or to go to our website um, to either make a one-time contribution or to become a monthly sustainer. And so those are all of the ways in which you can donate. Um, and we will talk more and, about that, but we do want to- I want to say something. It's interesting you talk about monthly sustainer because on Democracy Now! we're on 1,500 public radio and television and community radio and television stations around the world and online, and I'm always pitching for one or another of them. But really the new approach to it is talking about monthly donors, which is so important. And even if you think, well, I, of course I could do $5, but what do they need that for? Oh my gosh, it really adds up $5 a month or $10 a month or $20 a month. What a difference it makes, because this is really, this whole complex, this campus is a living organism. And knowing that you have that monthly support makes it possible to um, 
you know, not be just admired in debt, not that you are, you've amazingly covered so much of it, um, not only allows you to survive, but to thrive. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. What does thriving look like? What does a vibrant community that you all are a part of, and that's what makes it vibrant, that you're all in some way a part of it, whether you're a citizen or non-citizen journalists, or you're testing the water to keep people alive, um, or the air, or doing the gardening. I mean, this is truly an amazing model. I think the pandemic has taught us about what localism is about, how sustaining and vital it is, we have these rates of you know, mental illness and suicide and people's feelings of hopelessness. It all starts at home, giving someone, a young person, an older person, hope that there are people out there, that we're all in this together. And keeping this alive and moving forward is really so important. Absolutely, there is no donation too small that doesn't make a huge difference. The other point, Steve mentioned something really important. A grant-funded project for the first floor of Nature Lab cost $200,000. It came with a lot of regulations and rules and reporting and a lot of time. Steve actually had a full head of hair when he started the project. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, I still do. And, yeah. I still do. It's just cut short. Oh, excellent. Yeah. So, um, but when you become a sustainer, what you're saying is that you believe in what this organization is just at its roots and at its core, and that that is worth supporting. We don't have to come up with a new project or program or thing to do to satisfy some reporting requirement or hit uh, fill a box on someone's checklist. It's really just uh, your investment at whatever level is significant to you to support what we are already doing and what we're about. So I'm going to take a pause from there because I know folks want to come up and ask questions. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, we do want folks to come to the microphone because we are recording. And so if you have questions, um, you can come right up to this microphone and ask them. Or and you can even just come up and say you want to make a donation and that will inspire someone else. Absolutely. Feel free. All right. Hello, uh, Stephen, Amy, Taina, Seely, behind the mask. Um, greetings, community. Um, I guess this is a little testimony of my gratitude. I offered it a bit yesterday um, as a local artist, the ways that I have been so deeply supported and held as a radical artist uh, here in the Capital Region. Um, you know, one of the things that is important to me in my artistic ex exploration right now is thinking about not just what we wish to dismantle, not just what we wish to, um, to uh, burn down, but what do we wish to grow in that fertile soil of possibility. And using our, the, this powerful gift that we have as humans, our creativity, our imagination, to imagine that world, and then to uh, come back and figure out ways that we can practice that imagination, that vision in this present moment. And one of the things that I love about the Sanctuary for Independent Media, and you in particular, Steve and Branda, is that you really took that and ran in so many powerful ways. Um, all of the things that we've listed here today and so many more. And I know that this has come with a lot of work, a lot of turmoil sometimes, um, you know, uh, working to keep the lights on and everything open. Um, but yet and still you all continue to work to manifest and practice the world you wish to see in this community. And so one of the things that I'm curious about as you graduate from this position and move on, as I see it, graduating into the next phase of, of gifts that you have to offer this world, what do you dream of today 
for this next iteration of the sanctuary? We didn't imagine where it would go when we started it. Uh, the group of people who got together to talk about the, uh, renting the place from Russell at the time in 2004 probably, um, met on the, on the uh, deck at Brown's Brewing uh, looking at the Hudson and we had, we had actually saved, I think, uh, $20,000 and uh, royalties that we got from Democracy Now! for producing a video called Independent Media in a Time of War, uh, which featured Amy, Yay. and which we uh, took to uh, uh, talks around the country, around the world, and sold. And uh, so we had $20,000 in the bank, and we figured, well, we probably can make it for a year. Uh, if we rent Russell's place and you know pay expenses and so forth, and if you told me or probably told any of us at the time that it would evolve into this, I would have said you're crazy. We were going for a year, and we were just looking for a workspace. So a lot of it is just creating the material conditions for the, for the growth, for the imagination that you're talking about. It's difficult to imagine when you're hungry and scrambling uh, for rent all the time for food and rent. So a lot of it is that just. Guaranteeing the base, build a foundation. And I've always thought, and I think most of us have always thought, of the sanctuary and our projects here as being a platform. We've been building a platform for other people to use. Not everyone, mm -hmm. but for people who are engaged in the kind of work that we want to see. The, uh, the work that will uplift everybody and really confront the abuses of power that we see all over the place. For, for a number of years, we hosted the Justice for Demi group uh, that turned into Troy for Black Lives. Uh, we've done what we can to support other movements. So uh, I'm hoping that we can continue uh, growing this platform and create the space for other people to imagine what to do next. When we started renovating uh, Nature Lab, we thought of it as being a place where uh, we could do science work, and we are. We're, we're doing water testing in, in collaboration with Riverkeeper on the Hudson. We're doing soil testing, uh, testing for lead in neighborhoods like this that are heavily impacted by uh, fumes from gasoline-powered vehicles uh, in conjunction with a community in Chile, a town called Arica, both places devastated by lead contamination, and uh, where we work together to develop low-cost lead testing for soil. And now the Air Justice Lab, where we're working uh, to put air monitors around the capital region to test for uh, particulates in the air that are uh, carcinogens and otherwise incredibly hazardous to people's health. But as we did that, that's what we had in mind. But the people who lived in this neighborhood had in mind a program that would deal with basic health needs of people, the, the kinds of needs that come from seeing teenagers executed gangland style, year after year after year. Part of life in neighborhoods like this. Not everyone's life, but it's just part of the background. We've never been affected by it directly, but we know people around who have been. And they thought that what we needed to do, what the neighborhood needed, was a place where people could talk about those things and do something about it, organize to do something about it, and deal with the trauma that's related to it. We didn't think of that. It was something that we provided a platform for people to talk about, and then that we did. It's called the People's Health Sanctuary, and Eileen is very involved in that. Dr. Uh, uh, Janice uh, Pride Brune, uh, there's a many, uh, Kathy High. There are many people who are who are working on that. So I think I'll I'll, I'll leave it at that. That there's I don't think that there's a grand vision about what it can all be. I don't know what band will play here next year. I don't know what speaker will come. I don't know what film will be here. I don't know what building. Uh, will be next, I, I don't know. But I hope that we're still here to do it. Because I do know, addressing your comment about you know, trying to build, um, part of what drove us here was a 10-year organizing effort in Troy, trying to get in Troy what people all over the country already had, particularly in Massachusetts. Every community had public access television if they had cable. It was part of Massachusetts state law. The cable company had to give back for use of public rights of way, running their cables through streets, overhead, sidewalks, whatever. They had to provide production facilities and funding. They have to in Massachusetts, they still do. And so every community has a community television station. In New York, almost no community has community television because it's not required by the state. And so we tried to get the city of Troy to do what they have in New York, which is the backbone of democracy now's 
television programming, or was at the time, there was facilities that were set up where there are cameras and studios and people to do that. We tried for 10 years and couldn't get the people in the, running the city to ask the cable, to demand from the cable company to do what they should be doing by, by right, and they have to do in most other places. And after doing it for 10 years, we failed because the mayor refused to name a board member for the board of the organization or whatever. And we said, screw it, we're not doing that anymore. It's a waste of time trying to get other people to do what they should do. We're going to do it. Right. We're going to build our own. And we're not going to ask for permission. Right. And when they shut us down for doing what we're doing, we're going to fight back. And we're going to build back better mm -hmm. and bigger. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I think the goal should be for the future, is to stay strong, keep building. Don't look back. Don't let, don't let them drag us down. It's in your music, right? And I, and I always think about uh, your song in the time of the now, which you performed here on the stage. Yeah. Uh, we're not supposed to be here, and yet we are. Mm -hmm. You should be the one singing it, because I don't remember the <laughs> lyrics. But it's powerful. It's, it's in the music. Yeah. That's what we have to do. No one's going to give us anything. We've got to take it, and we have to make it. That's right. That's I hope that answers the question. And speaking of um, public access TV, I just wanted to acknowledge the godmother or the goddess oh, yeah. of public access TV, Dee Dee Halleck, who's in the house. So I have good news. I have been informed that we have reached 10,500. You're kidding. Yes. So. I'm going to donate 500, and I need three people to donate with me 500. Who else can donate 500 today? That's absolutely amazing. Nice. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Another person? Oh, Another oh my person. God. And another person right there. Anybody wow. else? So are Can you I the three? Are you Woo! Nina? Wow. <laughs> I I know I know this is real because um, we're having trouble transferring the uh, two-factor authentication code for our Venmo account for oh. those who, for those young people here from my cell phone to Kristen's cell phone. So every time somebody buys a piece of pizza, I get a text about it. And I've also been getting texts about the donation, so I know that this is for That's real. That's Now, are you saying with this incredible generosity that well, all we need is one person to match what you've raised so far, and it's this whole debt will be retired? <laughs> yes. But I also have JJ Luceno and Xavier Coughlin. They're involved in the PHS. They're not donating 500. They just texted me. Wow. So we have wow. Phone. You are halfway there. Yes. That's incredible. Is somebody keeping track? <laughs> so we are now more than halfway there, actually. And I have a challenge. So someone has said that if we can get five people to donate $100, that they will match it. Oh, my gosh. I will throw in the first 100. All right, do we have one, two, three, four oh over on the other side? Oh, six over oh here. Oh my God. So we have exceeded and we'll end seven in the back. <laughs> and eight right over here. All right, so that's another $1,300. We're gonna let Cena do a quick tally, but I think we have some folks with comments, so. Hey, good, good job, everybody. Uh, Amy, brilliant talk, so much appreciated. Steve, so much wonderful work here. Um, it's an honor to be a sustainer and to be able to help get closer to the, uh, to the goal. I have a simple question. We've talked about a lot of wonderful things that have happened here. And I look around, uh, one thing I think was not mentioned this, this evening, which has always impressed me so much, and that is the, uh, the people who work here who are getting trained on how to, uh, how to run a media operation. Oh, I've always thought amazing. that was one of the strongest things, the people who are running the, uh, the camera equipment, the people we don't see downstairs and what they're doing. And uh, 
if you could just say a little bit more about that program, because that's the future of independent media, the people who are trained to actually do the work, which I think is one of the great accomplishments of the, of the sanctuary. You didn't ask this, but the reason why we do it, the reason why we started doing the documentation here, I mean, obviously it's a media project, but it was mostly focused on what's called offline editing. You, know, you shoot a lot of footage and then you devote yourself to reducing it to a manageable amount, creating a program. It takes a long time. Much different than live production, which thankfully is over for the most part when you're done with the show. Um, but the, uh, when, we, when we moved into the sanctuary um, building, um, my, my impulse was to just not tell anybody. We just start using the building for what we were using for and not tell anybody at the city, just do it. Uh, always ask for, for, for forgiveness, don't ask for permission. I was advised by a uh, good friend, Joe Fama, at the Troy Architecture Project program not to do that. Go through the permitting process, uh, ask for permission, because what if, there, if there's ever a problem, if it's discovered that your doors are two inches too narrow, for example, uh, they'll go into their file and see that you didn't get the permits that you needed, and they'll shut you down. Um, so he rooted through the code and found uh, we, we had a problem because it requires 70 parking spaces for a new church, and we weren't grandfathered because there had been a lapse of use. And what he did find, though, was a category called Media Production Center which nobody had ever used in Troy. Nobody knew that it existed. And the gold mine there was it requires six parking spaces, not 70. So when we opened, we thought, uh-oh, we better be doing some media production in here uh, to explain, uh, and how do we explain the presence of all these people at our, at our shoot? Well, you're the live audience for a media production. Um, and that's, uh, we were so worried about it because we had a very antagonistic uh, relationship with the, uh, uh, with the then mayor of Troy and his staff, the same people who ended up sh trying to shut us down. Uh, so that's why we started doing it. And we realized afterwards, I, I don't know if folks are aware of this, but we have 100,000 subscribers to our YouTube channel, millions of views. This is not anything we ever planned. Uh, somebody pointed out to me at some point, did you know that you have 100,000 viewers to your YouTube channel? This is a goal that some organizations have. This is just a, a side business That's on huge. some level for us. It's huge. And people come here, like Chris Hedges, we used to call to, get, to ask him if he could come. Now he calls us to ask if he could come yeah. because when he has a new book or has something that he wants to distribute, he realizes that there's a great audience out there of people who are interested in it. There's no selling involved. Uh, but the, um, uh, the, so the, so this uh, wasn't entirely intentional, um, but uh, it's turned into a great thing for us. And uh, actually, anybody want to guess where the bulk of our listeners, our viewers are for our YouTube channel in the world? North Africa. Because we've had so many bands from North Africa performing here, and they're the, the only place you can find videos of them. Uh, Tuareg bands from Northern Mali, and uh, well, Salif Keita, who has no shortage of videos, but none in spaces this small with uh, media coverage this uh, uh, intense. Um, so, the, so, the, so the viewers come from an unexpected place. But your question was about training, and I can say that I'm ashamed to admit that I think throughout most of my tenure, training has been, okay, this is a camera, and this is the on button. Now, uh, uh, wear your headset, and good luck. And we've always aspired to having a more formal training program. And from time to time, we've been able to do it. But that's definitely something that we want to do more of. Uh, we want to be able to train young people, and uh, especially, but all, anybody who wants to learn how to do media on their own. And the thing about it that uh, a lot of people argued when we were trying to uh, push for a public access center in Troy, they said, um, public access is over. YouTube is the thing. It's all online now. Cable is done. And that may be more true now than it was when we were trying to ar uh, argue for it. But one thing that YouTube doesn't do is get 10 people in a room working together on technology that they don't know already to produce something that benefits everyone. YouTube and that type of media tends to be about me. And it's about me talking about what's important to me and trying to get a large audience for it. And it's usually trying to sell something or at least sell ads underneath. So the idea of working collectively to produce a media product that isn't about, that isn't a product, that isn't uh, something to sell or for sale is a revolutionary act. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to train people and get them continuing to do this kind of work. It's much different. It looks the same in a way when you see it on television. You don't really think about how did this get made? 
But if you think about it, the fact that these productions are almost zero dollar productions, it's all volunteers. And Steve, I think you're underselling what you all have created here because, I mean, the fact that you have a four camera shoot that's going on right now and downstairs, the people who are, I mean, this is not minor, um, putting this together, directing, and it will be edited, and you have four radio stations. I mean, this is incredible that are going all the time. You've got Troy, you've got Schenectady, you've got Albany. Um, and programmers who never thought before they could do something like this, or even maybe that they had something to share, and yet so many people identify. It is so impressive what you've accomplished here. Well, it's, uh, it all started uh, from uh, donated equipment. Uh, I remember that we got, uh, 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 when, when uh, High Definition TV came out, all these uh, commercial and educational operations started throwing away perfectly good standard definition equipment. And so we got a complete studio from CUNY, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Communist Party USA had a TV studio uh, uh, to, to run their, uh, they had a cable show that they distributed to cable access stations. I didn't know anything about it until they called and said they were getting rid of their equipment. And I drove down in a, pickup truck and picked up all this stuff. And you can see if you look at our YouTube channel, the colors are all off. I mean, it's, it was really terrible because uh, it was at a time when you needed something called uh, Genlock. You needed a video engineer to make this stuff work. And we didn't have a video engineer, but at least we, so, so <laughs> you can tell which videos they, the early ones were. And then we just started upgrading it as we went. And, uh, and eventually uh, our first loan that we ever got was to buy the cameras that we have here. Our, our brand new cameras, which we're so proud of her now, I realize uh, 13 years old. Um, but uh, it's just been a slow build. Troy, who's in the back, uh, Troy Pohl has really upped the game for us. Uh, he's, uh, in addition to the, to the TV operation, we also have a 24 track recording studio. So the early bands that came here, how did, you, how did we get Salif Keita, who performs in stadiums around the world, how do we get him to come to North Troy and play at a 100-seat auditorium. Fatumata Diarwa, all, mm -hmm. these, all these people, um, Amiri Baraka, I mean, the, all these people came in large part because they could come for a low fee and do a community service event. They wanted to come, but they got videos at a time when video was difficult to get. Huh. It's not that unusual anymore. Lots of clubs have video in the clubs, but at the time that we started doing it, nobody else did. And so it was a huge part of the economic model that we have, which is not based on door revenue, because the door is too small, you know, there's too few seats. <laughs> and it's not based on selling alcohol, which is how most people do it. It's really unusual. And a lot of bands appreciate the fact that they're playing to an audience that's listening to the music, not drinking. And particularly if they're from Muslim countries. So we've had a, a huge uh, success on that level. By the way, in addition to acknowledging Branda Miller, who's downstairs, I wanted to acknowledge my colleague, EP, Elizabeth Press, who um, was a longtime producer at Democracy Now! And then we lost her to Troy and to RPI and then to Community College here and to the Sanctuary for Independent Media. But I don't really think of it as losing her. It's just spreading the word and the incredible talent and creativity. And it's just great to be here with you, EP. Yes, th thank you. My name is Tom Ellis. And I want to congratulate both of you for the great work that you've done in your career. And um, for, I think you're, Steve, the Hudson Mohawk Magazine, I think, is the best locally produced radio show that I've ever heard. It puts to, <laughs> it puts to shame the local television stations. I mean, those are pathetic compared to even the one-hour show that you guys are doing every day. Huh. And Amy, I, got, I have a suggestion for a news story that I'd like you to cover. <laughs> And I'll be brief. You've probably heard of Blackstone Corporation. They, want to, they have a subsidiary and they want to bury an electric cable f for 100 miles underneath the Hudson River to bring electricity from Quebec to New York City. Is this it, Black Rock or Blackstone? Blackstone. Huh. And 
Uh, it's called the Champlain Hudson Power Express. And it's my belief that Hudson Riverkeeper is standing on both sides of this issue. They signed a stipulation in 2013 that allows the project to go forward. And now they're pretending to be opposed to it, but they won't withdraw from this stipulation. I think it's a great story. Installing the cable underneath the Hudson River would um, require dredging and it would put a lot of poisons that are buried on the bottom of the river uh, into the water. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you both, Amy and Steve, for all the work you do. Uh, I have a question, a journalism question, that um, may be more for Amy, but I'll tie the sanctuary into it, because um, it was either six or seven years ago that the, um, that the uh, six or seven years ago, uh, the journalist Matt Taibbi came to the sanctuary, and I came and listened to him talk, and then I talked with him after, and he was a great guy and doing great work then. So my question is, um, I'm, I'm really confounded by the work he's doing now and not really sure if he's, you call him independent journalist or what he is. And, and actually the same for Glenn Greenwald. I'm wondering, I don't know if you know Amy, where his head's at. He shows up on Tucker Carlson and just don't know, you know the stuff that both of them are doing and where, where they're at. So that's my question. I don't know. Yeah. No. Yeah. I also don't know. Uh, okay. I'll just say that I think that uh, there are uh, comfortable niches that uh, journalists have uh, occupied uh, for many years. And I think we're in times where uh, people have to get out of their niches. And we have to talk to people who don't already agree with us. And I think that that may be driving some of what's happened, not about these two people in particular, but I think some journalists are trying to put themselves in the frame of mind of people they don't agree with to try to understand why these people think the way they do. And I think that can be a very difficult thing to hear um, and difficult to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think these are really difficult times that we're in uh, in, the, in the media world when you see what's happening. Look at what's happening with MSNBC and Fox and where the, everything is so regimented that you can just go to whatever place you want to hear what you want to hear. And I think we all fight that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. This is a shout out to Didi Halleck for putting my parents together. <laughs> Thank you, Didi. If it wasn't for you, this would have never happened. <laughs> for the sanctuary, no shows are done. Okay, Marsha Miller. Thank you. I love you, Didi. I forgot. I forgot, I forgot. Okay, my, my, my proudest uh, uh, production, uh, Masha Miller, who is pointing out, See? who actually is one of the co-founders of the sanctuary. She spent an unhealthy amount of her childhood in the basement here. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, she has told me before not to touch her shoulder, but you know what? I have a short-term <laughs> memory. I'm so sorry about that, and I'm a hugger. So I wanted to tell you, 4,475, can anybody match 100? I also have a 100 donation. Anybody, 100? One, in the, one here, one in the back, anybody else? Oh, and over there. 100 and 100? Okay, perfect. I'll be back and thank you. <laughs> So standing in the wrong place here. Uh, okay, I, I watch Democracy Every Day on YouTube, and they tell people to watch it, and the only option is watching on YouTube. What's, what what would be involved in getting you on you know, public television here? Well, thank you so much. You know, we are on satellite TV, on Dish Network, and Direct TV, yeah. um, and also, of course, online at democracynow.org. And you can listen um, right here at the Sanctuary's radio stations as well. Yeah. There, are, there, are, there are a number of places, as a Amy said. Um, it's on our radio station, which is WOOC 105.3 at uh, 8 a.m. and 3 and 5 p.m. It's on at the same times on partner stations. We don't own them, but we work with other organizations, 98.9 um, in Schenectady, 
92.7 in Post and Kill. It's a country music format for folks who like that, but they also, there's also News and Public Affairs and in Albany at 106.9. And if you're in Schenectady, I believe that they still have it on open stage TV uh, on cable. Um, and as Amy says, it's on the internet, it's on satellite TV. There's a lot of places. It's, it's a, I remember what a struggle it was to, to just get basic carriage for democracy now at the beginning. And it's just really remarkable how well you've done uh, over the years. I mean, I think it's also just a testament at the global level, the hunger for independent voices um, and the fact that it really amplifies voices like those you have here and brings them to a global level. That is the kind of independent media that is a model. <laughs> and Dennis is demonstrating volunteer management here. Uh, <laughs> basic, basic techniques. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I've seen so many hands come up, and I just want to thank everybody who has contributed. If anybody else has any contributions, you're welcome to see me, drop off any checks. We also have some wonderful raffles, and they're based on our old programming. We have these we have a rack of our previous uh, flyers which have been reprinted as posters and we have an assortment of buttons that have been done by volunteers. They are one of a kind, <laughs> including, where's Amy Goodman? Right here, somewhere. And um, oh, here it is. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. We also, so we have the raffle ticket. We have five posters. We also have a pair of tickets to see Vir Farca Touré, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. We also have t-shirts reprinted of our classic merchandise. And um, I, you know, I'm, I feel super fortunate to be a staff member here because I was an intern back in 08, 09, and it made such an impression on me. And so it means a lot to see all of the support from everybody who's here. So feel free to come see me or Kaylin, and I think, yeah, I appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much. And um, we're gonna let Amy and Steve wrap up and enjoy all of your company shortly, but one of our fabulous uh, camera operators and former staff member, Melissa Bromley, had a great question, for Amy in particular. Um, you know, we imagine that once upon a time, uh, having a program like Democracy Now! seemed like a dream. So for independent media makers here at the Sanctuary who are working on the Hudson Mohawk Magazine, who are creating stories, um, can you share any bits of wisdom about staying the course and being able to kind of realize uh, a dream like having a program well, like I Democracy Now? I think you now? really said it, is staying the course. You know, you start by producing, for example, Hudson Mohawk Magazine. And there's no telling where that will take you or who will respond to it. Democracy Now! was just supposed to be a nine-month project it started in 1996 as the only daily election show in public broadcasting on radio, on what, nine community radio stations, maybe WRPI was one of them, I'm not sure, at that time, 27 years ago. And we were really getting ready to pack up the day after the 1996 election when uh, President Clinton was re-elected. And stations started calling, I mean, our approach to it, I was called um, <clears throat> to host the show. I was at an underground house in Haiti, um, in Haiti where when you declared for your candidacy for a position in the parliament or for president, you could be gunned down. You could be gunned down if you went out to vote. And the vast majority of Haitians voted and were deeply involved with politics. And when they said, do you want to do a daily election show? I said, in the United States, less than half the people vote. But I never thought it was because of apathy, but maybe because people didn't think there was a big enough choice or they were involved in other ways in their community. And so maybe we'd use the primary system, you know, from state to state and look at what people were doing in their communities. And that's what we did for nine months. And so when the election came and went, it was those authentic voices that people wanted to hear more of. And so more and more stations, rather than saying, okay, we're accepting the end of democracy now, said we want more. And so 
We continued the show daily, grassroots, independent international investigative news hour, and then another station joined, and then another. And five years later, uh, September 11th, the attacks on the World Trade Center with the closest national broadcast to Ground Zero, just doing radio. But that week, coincidentally, we were starting on public access TV in Manhattan, Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And they wanted to put us on as emergency broadcasting. And it just took off from there. I mean, Didi, it was all about Didi and Paper Tiger and getting these video cassettes at the time out to stations all over the country asking if they could run our daily hour. We were FedExing, UPSing. Uh, we didn't want to use the regular mail because this was breaking news and we wanted to get it, them to get it at least the next day or two. And so we were working in collaboration with, um, with their nonprofits with DD's nonprofits and soon you know the 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 UPS and FedEx guys were coming with garbage bags filled with these video cassettes to send out and when we would go on a public access TV station the local radio would say can we run you we were the only TV we the first TV radio broadcast and then the NPR station would say, could we run you? And then the PBS station started saying, hey, what if you have on, you're on public access, what about us? And that's how it grew to these 1,500 stations and our headlines translated into Spanish as well for Spanish language in the United States and uh, Spanish language radio stations around the world and continues to grow with a station a week asking to run Democracy Now! Um, I would just add... Uh, if, uh, actually, Amy, I just want to say that before the cassettes were, we were on satellite, and there were 260 stations that ran it on satellite, so we didn't have to send the... But then the, they, there were ones that, didn't, that couldn't download uh. it, or maybe their, um, the, the company wouldn't let them put it on because it didn't come from the That's studio true. there or whatever. But the satellite was the basic, and that was Deep Dish, which... Oh, which, that was Deep Dish but, too, right, right, yeah. you're right. Um, I'll just Stand add to that, corrected. that the, the platform that uh, Democracy Now! was built on came from pacifists after World War II. The Pacifica network itself was a creation of people who were uh, imprisoned uh, for refusing to fight and who used their time in prison in the mountains to talk about what they could do to keep the next war from happening. And they determined that media access was what it would take. Because even then, in the, in the 40s, they saw that there was this misinformation uh, being promoted around the world that created conflict, didn't reduce it. And they came up with the idea with non-commercial radio that would be supported by listeners, not by advertisers. That was a radical thought at the time. They invented the idea of listener support. And if it wasn't for the actions of pacifists in the 1940s, there would not have been a platform to base Democracy Now! on. And if it hadn't been for Democracy Now!, there wouldn't have been a platform for us to base what we're doing on. So it, it, it's all cumulative. Thank you so much. That does conclude our program. It does not conclude our celebration. Um, I want to give a, a quick shout out to the folks who have um, supplied our cafe this weekend, O'Malley's Oven, Rock Hill Bakehouse, and Bacchus Pizza. And we're hoping that you will stick around and have some refreshments and be in each other's company. We'd also like to thank the co-sponsor, um, Women Against War. Um, so as I said, yeah, the celebration continues, um, but please join me right now in giving a big round of applause and a huge thank you to Amy Goodman and Steve Pierce. Thank you all so very much for coming out. None of it possible without the people in this room. Really That's appreciate great. it. Dr. Moffey.